<laughs> How many of you know people who moan and groan and complain about life all the time, all right? <laughs> they might moan and groan about their job. I'm sick of this job. I'm sick of you. And they just moan and groan and complain all the time and never do anything about it. They haven't got to the point where they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. They just have enough energy to complain about it. And they consider that, in fact, they believe that that's equivalent to doing something about it, just complaining. No, that can't get you where you want to go. That cannot create your reality for you. The other thing that keeps most people from realizing their true greatness and their true potential, circumstances, their environment. There are many people who believe because of where they're born, because of the area where they are in life and where they find themselves, that's all they know. Given my circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. See, I know something about you, even not knowing you, that you've got greatness within you. You have the ability to do things that you can't even begin to imagine. You have talents and skills in you that you haven't even begun to reach for yet. No one could have convinced me, given my circumstances, given my background, that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. I was born in Liberty City on a floor on 62nd Street, my twin brother and me. When we were six weeks of age, we were adopted. When I was in fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled educable mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I have no college training, but here's what happened. I had an intervention in my life. A man who saw something in me in a time that I did not see something in myself. I never forget being in his class one day waiting on a friend of mine who was there to rehearse for a play. He did not show up and he asked me to go up to the board and write something on the board. And I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I'm, well, I'm I'm in a special education class. He said, what do you mean? I said, go up to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. I said, I can't do that, sir. Why not? I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that changed my life. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said that once a person's mind is expanded with an idea or a concept, it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. So some of you are going to experience a breakthrough. Some of you are going to go back and look at your dreams and brush them off. Some of you are going to begin to look at yourself and say, hey, look here, I know I have not done all that I can do. Whatever goal that you have in mind, I want that to be a goal that will challenge you, something that will make you stretch. It was Osborne who said, unless you attempt to do something beyond that which you've already mastered, you will never grow. What is it that you looked at at some point in time and you decided that you couldn't do it? That you talk yourself out of it? Whatever it is, bring it back out there. How are you going to do it? That will come to you in due time. So you don't get in life what you want, ladies and gentlemen. You get in life what you are, not what you want. And see, the good news is that we can always become more by working to develop ourselves. So the first process of making this your decade, you've got to begin to take a look at your life and look at where are you right now? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What gives your life a sense of fulfillment, a sense of joy? What does a full, rich life mean to you? What is it that you could love doing seven days a week that will bring a smile to your face? <laughs> Think about that. In all the areas of your life, your professional life, your personal life, your family life, your spiritual life, what is it that you'd like to have? Once you begin to determine that, that takes you to the next step. And that is, once you decide what it is that you want, now you've got to decide that you deserve that. Repeat after me, please. I deserve, I deserve the, best the best that life has to offer. Has to offer. I, deserve I deserve to find, to find my, purpose in life. my purpose in life. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, find your purpose. Do you know by actively pursuing your purpose, it could perhaps extend your life? The number one killer in this country of all the diseases we have, heart disease, that's the number one killer. And if you ask most people, when is it that, that the majority of people have their first major heart attack? Some people will tell you as a result of obesity or smoking cigarettes or high cholesterol or high blood pressure. 
And all of those are contributing factors. However, the truth of the matter is that most people don't realize that the majority of people suffer their first major heart attack on Monday morning between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. People getting ready to go to jobs that they don't like, jobs that are making them sick. You see, when you're not pursuing your goal, you are literally committing spiritual suicide. When you have some goal out here that you're stretching for and reaching for, that takes you out of your comfort zone, you'll find out some talents and abilities you have that you didn't know you have. I started speaking just to elementary school kids because I knew they didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and they gave me all kind of standing ovations. We like you, yeah, yeah. Then I graduated up to junior high school and then to senior high school and then to various community groups and church groups and civic associations and then to colleges and to businesses. Now I'm traveling across the country and then traveling nationally and internationally. But I never would have discovered what I'm able to do right now if I wasn't willing to take a chance. And you've got to be willing to do that. You've got to believe in yourself. I was doing work for a major corporation and they were having a major downsizing. It's just another terminology for major firings. And so the people that were working there, they approached them and said, listen, you are eligible for early retirement. We will give you a buyout package of $300,000 if you take it within this time frame. However, after this time frame, when we have the downsizing, you might be among the people cut and you will lose all of benefits that we're talking about right now, and the most you can get is two weeks severance pay. Ladies and gentlemen, only 50% of the people that were eligible took this. Let me tell you something. If I'd been there, I'd have gone to ask for your check. <laughs> Listen, Marvin told me to get his check. He's home with his mama. <laughs> taking that money so quick and it had other people checks. They said, Les got your check. <laughs> See, ladies and gentlemen, life is too short trying to play it safe. It's too short and unpredictable being miserable. It's too short for that. Here's the thing. There's no safe position in life. Let me tell you why. It's a quiet secret that most people don't realize. You can't get out of life alive. <laughs> Hello, you can't get out of life alive. So there's no safe position. You can die in the bleachers or you can die on the field. You might as well come out on the field and have a good time, right? <laughs> so if you want to make this your decade, you've got to decide to be bold. So you've got to be bold in life. You gotta take life on. I remember I was at a major corporation, I had to give a presentation, and there were two guys sitting across from me, and the guy said to the other fellow, looking at the last two finalists, and that involved my firm and their firm, said, listen, looking at the credentials, this guy doesn't have any credentials. We have an advantage here. We've got two PhDs between us. I got up and I went in the bathroom and started talking to myself. I said, Les Brown, what do you care about their two PhDs? You have six children. <laughs> and a mama to take care of. And I went in that meeting and first of all, I went at walking bowl, looking good, feeling good, and smelling good, all right? And I sat across that table and we started negotiating and I operated in a spirit of absolute certainty. I looked at them as if the only reason that they were born was to give me that contract. <laughs> They survived one out of nine million sperms to carry out this transaction. <laughs> and I got the contract. Hello. <laughs> so you've got to decide to be bold. Most people go through life trying to creep. No, no, no. Trying to be casual about it. No, no, no. You go through life being casual, you'll end up a casualty. No. Uh-uh. You've got to be bold in life. You've got to take life on. Now here's something else. You must be positive. See, a lot of people, when things don't happen when they want it, want it to happen, they become negative and they turn out and start projecting a lot of negative energy. No, no, you've got to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to be positive. Because see, when you know within yourself things are gonna work out for you, when you know within yourself that some way, somehow, you're going to make it, 
And this is just some, these are just some of the hoops you've got to flip through in order to get there. It's okay. Have a friend who went to get a job and the people didn't hire him. He was so negative. Well, hey, to hell with you then. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. They just don't have a job today. <laughs> don't burn your bridges behind you. Don't talk about the guys, mama. Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, here's the last thing. If you want to reach your goal and have a competitive edge, you've got to be hungry. A lot of people love me to tell this story. When I got out of school, you know, my first major goal was to buy my mother a home. And my hero in broadcasting was Paul Harvey. And I wanted to become involved in broadcasting. And I love the disc jockeys that were on the air. And I wanted to become a disc jockey. And Mr. Washington said something to me that I'll never forget who was my mentor in high school. Repeat this. Whitney Young is his quote. It's better to be prepared, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity, for an opportunity and, not and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. See, so I started working to develop my communication skills and expand my vocabulary. I started visualizing myself being a disc jockey. I saw myself on the air having a talk show and playing records and people listening to me. That was my vision. That was my dream. I held that in mind constantly. And I would practice all the time. Practice makes what? Absolutely not. This, this just dislodge that from your mind. Practice only makes improvement. Perfection doesn't exist. You need to take it out of the dictionary. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Practice only makes improvement. You can always better your best. You have not done your best work yet. As long as you're here, you have a chance to transcend yourself. So don't believe in perfection. It doesn't exist. It only makes improvement. So I would practice, practice, practice. Every day, every day, every day. And finally, I went over to this radio station, asked a guy for a job, and Mr. Bellevue, and I said, how are you doing, sir? I'd like to get a job. I was working on Miami Beach at, at the Fountain Blue Hotel at the time. The Jackie Gleason and the June Taylor dancers were famous. And my favorite program on television, most people would not remember, John Beresford Tipton. Hi, my name is Michael Anthony. I have a check for $1 million. How many of you remember that program, all right? The Millionaire, that was my favorite program on television, you know? So if this is my fantasy, you know? And every time we would drive from Miami Beach, I would fantasize, oh, that's the house. When I get my million, I'm going to buy my mother that home over there. So that was my fantasy. So I went up to Mr. Butterball, and he said, do you have any radio experience? I said, no, sir. Do you have any background in journalism? I said, no, sir. I said, but I can never get experience if you don't give me the opportunity. I've been practicing a lot, sir. He said, I'm sorry, we don't have any job for you. I said, thank you, sir. He didn't know my reasons for being there. My reason, I wanted to use radio as a means to earn the money to buy my mother home. I went back to the radio station again. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? My name is Les Brown. I know your name. Didn't I just see you here yesterday? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I said, y'all have any jobs here? Didn't I tell you yesterday we didn't have a job? <laughs> yes, sir, but I thought maybe somebody got fired or resigned. I don't know, sir. <laughs> I went the next day. How you doing, Mr. Butterball? He said, yes. And I just didn't take it personal. How you doing? So y'all have any jobs here? Didn't I just tell you yesterday and the day before we didn't have any work? Well, I thought maybe somebody died, so I didn't know. I didn't know. I went the next day, showed up like nothing was wrong, like I saw him for the first time. How you doing, Mr. Butterball? Y'all having there? He said, boy, make yourself useful. Go get me some food. I said, yes, sir. See, many times when you want more, you've got to be willing to pay your dues. So I became their errand boy. I went to get their lunch and their, their dinner and all kind of food for them. After a while, I would take the food to them in the control room, and I would not leave until they would ask me to, and I'd watch them working the controls, and I'd memorize their hand movements. And pretty soon, they would trust me with their cars to go pick up entertainers that came into town, entertainers like Sam Cooke, um, Dinah Ross and the Supremes, the Four Tops and the Temptations. I would drive them all over Miami Beach in the disc jockey's cars. I didn't have any driver's license, but I'd drive it like I had some. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, one day I was at the radio station and a guy by the name of Rock was drinking while he was on the air. It was a Saturday afternoon. I was the only one there. None of the other jocks were available. And I was looking at him through the control room window, <laughs> saying, Drink, Rock, drink. <laughs> drink, Rock. I'd have gone to get him some more if he'd asked me to. Drink rock. Pretty soon the phone rang. It was the general manager. I said, hello. He said, Les, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs to come in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be thinking I'm crazy. 
I called my mom and my girlfriend Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn up the radio. I'm about to come on the air. <laughs> I waited for about 20 minutes, and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, do you know how to segue the records? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get behind those controls. I put the headphones on. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P, Les Brown, your platter playing Papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and doubly qualified to bring you satisfaction, a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. <laughs> when you are able to have charge of your destiny. Doesn't it? Gives you a good feel. You can give, it gives you choices. You can do more things. See, my first major goal was to buy my mother a home. I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. And I said to my mama one day, I said, Mama, when I become a man, I'm going to buy you a home. And you won't have to go to work every day. You won't have to work. You just sit down, Mama. She was getting up, getting dressed to go to the M&M cafeteria. I was just following her around. I said, watch, Mama. One day, you won't have to leave here to go to work no more. It's raining outside. You won't have to go to work in the rain. You just do what you want to do, like stay home and fix me sweet potato pie. <laughs> My mama fixed the kind of sweet potato pie you can't eat with your shoes on. You have to take your shoes off so you can wiggle your toes, all right? <laughs> But that was my dream, that was my passion, I saw that, and that drove me, that was my reason for being. So one of the things, in order to make this your decade, in order to reach your goals, you've got to find some reasons that make you strong, some reasons that will make you hang in there when times get rough, because they're going to get rough. It's going to be very challenging. Whenever you decide that you want to grow, whenever you decide that you want to go to another level, all hell will break loose. Everything that will happen, the other that can happen will happen, and at the worst possible moment. They call it Murphy's Law. See, whenever you decide that you want to go to another vibration, it's like when you get into an airplane. The first thing they tell you to do is do what? Fasten your seatbelt. Because you're going to experience some turbulence when you're going up. And some of you are already experiencing that turbulence. Don't be frightened by that. See, whenever you decide you want to go to another level, you've got to fasten your psychological, your mental, and your spiritual seatbelt. Because it's going to be a while before you experience a comfortable altitude. You're going to get there. It's there. But you've got to go through this phase here. This is how you grow. This is how you develop. See, life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes things go well, and sometimes they don't go well. But in the down moments, that's when you discover who you are. During the down moments, see, in this prosperous time, you put it in your pocket. In the lean times, you put it in your heart. And that's when you discover who you are. <laughs>